Well, okay. I'd like to welcome everybody this evening. It's a it's a good evening to be inside. Um, tonight we uh, have this great presentation that's very near and dear to me: how to improve your call for entry photos. Um, some of you may know, some of you may not know, but your call to entry photos can gain a second life, um, especially at our gallery. Um, we could use it for uh, putting up a virtual gallery. Um, we could use it for marketing. Um, so a great photo has a long life with us and, and a, it has a great value for you. Anyways, our presenter tonight, our instructor is Amy Clean. She's a grandmother of nine. She studied photography while in college and has an MFA in photography. Uh, she's now a retired IT contract project management manager. Um, she's involved in selling cut flowers, perennials, shrubs at farmer's markets. Uh, she's now once again enjoying having time to do, you know. Um, she's an award-winning photographer and active member of Manassas Warrington Camera Club and the Virginia Beltway Photographers. Um, just want to remind you that we are recording this session tonight. I ask that you please keep mute it. Um, once we get past slide 11, uh, we will welcome you to ask questions. So Amy, can I hand this over to you? Of course you can. Hello, folks. Uh, what I want to do is basically see if I can give you some hints on how to make your photographs better for all the stuff that uh, uh, Dale had indicated for you. Uh, we're going to do that by um, taking a look at some things that are good and bad and in, in different photos, uh, both 2D and 3D, and how to take uh, care of some of the issues that you come up with. So with that in mind, um, we're going to take a look at 2D, meaning any uh, photos that you might have, sketches, uh, lithographs, anything that's basically flat. And then we're going to take a look at uh, your 3D things, you know, uh, different kinds of those. We're also going to discuss um, what makes up a quality photo, what the characteristics are, and then uh, figure out how we can set up your studio without it costing you an arm and a leg. And then finally, we're going to take a look at some photos and uh, show you some stuff that's uh, really not very nice and then how to fix it. Uh, in addition, uh, in there, we're going to briefly discuss uh, some things for submission. What we have is, here again, I already discussed, we've got two, two different kinds of, of art. And obviously, you want to have a good photo of them. And in some respects, what is required of a photo is somewhat different between the two types of art that there are. All right, so when we talk about a quality photo, exactly what is a quality photo? Uh, what's most important is that the photo is good of what you want it to represent. In other words, um, you don't want anything competing with your artwork. Um, you want it to be in focus. You want it to actually look good and exactly as close to exact um, to what it really is um, as you can get. Uh, you don't want it fuzzy. You don't want anything else fighting with it um, to go through that. Um, we have um, different uh, types of photos and we'll take a look at those. Uh, one of the things that's in, kind of important is the fact that you don't really need to be a professional photographer. 
um, you can set up what I would call a studio um, in your house and it doesn't take a lot of time or money. It does not take a lot of time. In other words, you can set it up in anywhere from no setup to you know, 10, 15 minutes or whatever, depending on exactly what you wanna do. Uh, there are different places where you can set it up. Um, living room, dining room, kitchen. Uh, I've actually even gone outside and uh, stuck and put different things that I wanna take photos of on the hood or trunk of a car. Uh, just because uh, that's what was convenient at the time. Um, what I have listed are, you know, different places in the house where you can set something up and it's not going to be um, difficult and you can actually easily, easily set it up. So with that, what we need to do is we need to take a look at what you need in order to make that good photo. Um, in a lot of instances, you're going to need a solid, uh, solid background. Um, here again, the background becomes much more important when you're working with something I consider 3D, like a sculpture. And we'll, uh, we'll actually have an example of that. Um, what's more important is the fact that if you have a 2D, like a print or a painting or something, that you have it so that it doesn't move. In other words, you set it up, you stand it up, and it's not wobbling back and forth and, or falling down while you're trying to take a picture of it. And what's kind of neat is that you can actually take and place it anywhere from something hanging from the wall, or you can actually even put it on the, on the floor. So uh, what's more important for 3D artwork, the sculptures, the um, ceramics and so forth, is that you actually have a complementary surface, both in back of the photo and below it. Um, some things that can be used I have listed, in other words, poster board, project board, foam core, plastic core, carpets, tablecloths. Um, what I have used and what is kind of nice, I actually sometimes even take it outside for, with my photos, is I have science fair project board in black. And what I can do is I can actually sit it on the ground or sit it on something and it's actually got the little support arms in back of it so that you get a plain, black background for what you want to take a photo of. And from that particular perspective, it works kind of nice because that keeps uh, a lot of distractions out of the way. But you can, you know, I have poster board, project board, and all that kind of stuff because I have grandchildren around who have projects. So that's there, but it's not going to cost an arm and a leg to go out and, you know, pick up a poster board, either black or white or one, a couple of both you know, they're a buck a piece or so. So tablecloths, all of that, you, you readily have uh, something that can be used in, in your house, you know, from your house. So we've talked about the background, but exactly what is the artwork position? Here again, uh, 2D or 3D. You know, 2D, you need um, not to fall over, you need to look at it straight on so that you get the same perspective as if you were viewing at it directly with your eyes. Um, what happens is that way you don't get keystoning. You don't get, or it doesn't become, if it's rectangular or square, it doesn't become a trapezoid. Um, as well as that way, sometimes depending on the camera that you have, um, you have um, you have a distortion from your camera lens and you know it needs to be you need to take a look at it from that perspective you know so that you have it so that there's no distortion um, if you're actually putting something like fabric up on the wall guess what 
wrinkles show. You know, stick it in the dryer, pull out the iron, um, take the lint off of it. Um, and in some instances, you can use it for the back and the same piece of fabric for the back as well as underneath the artwork. Um, what I've used is I've actually used blankets. I've used raw pieces of fabric, even towels, uh, just a, a whole bunch of different things. And some of it also depends, um, particularly with um, 3D, what you're trying to show with your artwork. Um, for stabilizers, in other words, you don't want this thing shaking all over the place. So you want to make sure that it's stable, it's not moving. You know, you have different kinds of pins that you can use. If you have something like a cork board or something that you're doing it, you can use the push, pin, push pins or straight pins or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I've actually uh, gone through and set stuff up and taken a look at what's around and see what I can use to prop it up. In other words, I want to make it straight up and down and you know, if you just sit it there, it has a tendency to lean. So see what you can do to make it straight up and down, which is particularly important for your uh, two dimensional stuff. Uh, here again, bookends, easel tray, um, the back of a chair. I have a dining room chair that I've used uh, I've, to uh, take photos on. Um, one of the things that um, I was just reminded of by my brother is you can use the floor, uh, put it on a carpet, put it on hardwood, depending on what, particularly if it's something like um, a sketch or a print and it hasn't been matted, uh, they're, they, you want them flat and it's a little bit more difficult to hang them up. So just sit it on the floor or sit it on a flat surface. Um, on to the next, lighting. What is a must is good lighting. Um, it makes all of the difference. Um, you don't want splotches, you don't want different colors, you don't want uh, some of it to be entirely black because it's more uh, backlit. Um, so how are you going to take care of that? You're going to use different lights that you find in the house. Yes, a professional photographer goes out and spends $150, $200 a light. Um, but what you can do is you can just use lights that you have around the house. Um, it's not terribly important what, where they come from, but as you will see, what you can do is you can, you know, make some taller, make some shorter, turn them on, change the bulbs, uh, use it in combination with a window. Um, when we're talking about windows, um, really the best light you have is if you actually have a north facing window because um, that way you don't get any bright lights, you don't have any of the reflections and stuff that, that cause a, an issue, although um, I have just a few north facing windows. Um, I have a tendency more to use an east window, uh, which does have issues first thing in the morning. So sometimes I wait till later in the day or actually even at night to um, deal with my lighting. So cameras. I know we'd all would love to go out and buy high-end Nikon or a Canon or whatever, and then we take the next year or two figuring out how, how to use it. Or we put it on automatic mode. Uh, but what I'm telling you is that uh, people nowadays have uh, cell phones. If you have a fairly recent cell phone, you've got a camera. And guess what? You can make fairly decent photos with a cell phone, particularly seeing as uh, when you submit your photos, they don't want them to be huge. Um, some of your professional cameras, a single file 
is 28 uh, is 28 meg. All right, that's pretty big. Matter of fact, um, I can't even email 20 28 meg. I have to go in Dropbox or something like that if I want to have it taken a look at. So the cameras, even as far down as like an iPhone 5, I think has some camera that is of the resolution, which is five meg or five meg or smaller, um, that you can work with. Um, however, what you need to take a look at is the fact that um, your file format. In other words, if you have a cell phone, some of them have different kinds of formats when they take a photo. And you need to take a look at what uh, it says for your submission. In other words, they send out, they say, okay, we want your, we want to take a look at your artwork. However, in order to submit it, you need to submit a photo and it has to be of one of these specific uh, file types. And it has to be five mag or less in, in file size because they don't want to spend half their life downloading them or uploading them or taking a look at them because they can get really, it can get really difficult as well as <clears throat> uh, for consistency sake, when they're actually judging them, they want to have it so that there's some consistency among the different pieces of work so that um, they can actually do a reasonable judging of, of, of what it is. And the same thing, you need to, um, uh, take a look at what the file naming is. All right, so in order to do that, you're probably going to have to have to have at least some computer knowledge or um, snag one of your kids to or grandkids or whatever to help you rename it. But that whole issue with changing file types and size and your name, that's a whole nother ballpark if you can't, if you can't, if you don't know how to do it. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Um, let's take a look at the next one. What we have is different things that can go wrong. You know, what can actually go wrong when you're trying to take a photo? Um, lots of things. Um, believe me, I know. I, I fight with focus all the time. Um, my husband likes everything in the whole photo in focus. I like to focus on some stuff and have the rest of the stuff blurry, but the issue is trying to make it the way that it needs to be for submission. All right. So if it's not in focus or blurry, what you need to do is you need to figure out your light. You know, it might be too dark, uh, and because it's too dark, you're going to be sitting there like this, and you're going to push the button, and you're going to move your camera. Um, you could use a tripod, you know. Uh, I was talking to my brother, and he said, yeah, I use a tripod all the time. It cost me 15 bucks. Okay, well, that's not a professional tripod because professional ones run 250, but it gets the job done for what he's, he's uh, using it for. Cause he takes a, uh, he takes photos of a lot of his um, memorabilia and, and different kinds of things. Cause he uh, uses some of it in his books. Uh, cause he's an author. Um, you want to set up the camera so that you actually take a picture or focus on what you want to take a picture of, you know, not the background, not the foreground, not the, not the, you know, not the dust bunnies that at least some of them that I have, but what you want to focus on is actually the piece of art itself. Um, in higher end cameras, you can actually set the focus and actually even with some of the newer iPhones and I'm sure your Samsungs and stuff, you can set the focus so that you can actually tell relatively easily what's in focus and what's not in focus. Um, for all of these things, one of the easy way to do it, particularly with a phone or with a camera, is they have a review mode. 
what you do is you just go in and say, oh, let me take a look at this and see what it says. You know, if you have a 35 millimeter camera, digital or otherwise, you know, digital camera of some kind, either uh, an all digital or a DSLR, what you do is you hit the you hit hit the little buttons that say, let me review this. All right. And then what you can do in a lot of instances is they have touch screens so that you can expand them to see if really what you want in focus is in focus. Um, along with that, when you're taking a look at it, you can tell if it's distorted. All right, what does that mean? You need to be centered in the object. You don't need any, um, particularly with flat things, you don't need to have it a tripod. You don't need a keystone. You know, you need to stay square and parallel and um, take a look at it to, to make sure that it's ex what you want. Uh, another thing that is a real issue, um, and sometimes I don't even notice it, you know, if you're all intense on taking a look uh, and you find that the reflections, um, or it's not even, it's not evenly lit. Uh, with the reflections, I, I've taken lots of pictures of myself. Um, I do a fair number of, of car photos. Uh, my husband's a, a car collector, Saab, so we go to meets and stuff. And, you know, I take a look at and take photos of different, different kinds of cars. And guess what? Chrome bum bumpers are great reflectors. But if you're on the inside, you know, if you have your windows or if you have... Um, uh, your lights in different places, or even uh, like here with, I have lights over my head and uh, in, in back of me. And, and all of that makes a big difference on what you're going to do. Um, the requirements for uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional are, are different. Uh, the reflections particularly, um, I know, some things you have in glass boxes or whatever, if you can manage to take it out of the box, it's not a bad thing or out of the frame. And I have um, an example of that and we'll, that we'll take a look at. Another thing that works really well is, yes, you're working on the object that's directly in front of you, but guess what? If you have a whole lot of light around and in back of you, you, you're not controlling that. So the best thing to do is make everything as dark as you can. And that way you're manipulating just what's on the object, either, you know, two or 3D. And that way you can see a little bit better and have a little bit uh, better control over what's going on. Um, on to the next. All right, what can go wrong and how to fix it? Well, the photo shows obviously somebody that was trying to take a picture of something wonderful in their bathroom, but they got a really good selfie. Um, um, don't ask me where the photo came from. My daughter put it in there for me. She says, well, what I wanted to do is I wanted to show the fact that they were taking a picture of something in the bathroom and they took a picture of the mirror with them in it. It's a reflection. You know, you also have problems with shadows. Um, if you're actually taking a, an art photo, you want the shadows, but when you're taking, taking a look at stuff for display, you don't necessarily want to have them. Um, and once again, darken the rest of the room so that you can tell with only the lights that you have shining on what you're trying to take a picture of so that you can tell what's going on. You know, if you have it that it's too dark, Add more light, change your camera settings. Um, my iPhone does a really good job of actually setting all of that up automatically. If you have a point and shoot camera, most of that, uh, most of those have an automatic mode where it sets it up and you don't really have to do a, an awful lot. Obviously, if you're running with a, a higher end 35 millimeter, you have more control or here again, you can shoot it in automatic mode. Uh, depending on how dark it is, you may need to stabilize your camera. By that, you can stick it on a box, 
put it on a tripod, set it up so that it's parallel to what you're trying to take a picture of, and then go for it. All right, now, uh, what we have here is if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I'm going to show you a bunch of examples and then how we fix some of the issues. Uh, this is a, a photo. It's not you know, a photo print that I had and it's framed with glass or at least I think it's glass. It might be, it might be acrylic, I don't remember. And it's matted. And, you know, I set it up so that it was reasonably stable, but guess what? It's got lots of stuff around it. It's got reflections all over it. Um, and, you know, there's just a whole bunch of junk around it. So if you put that in, they wouldn't be able to, if you submitted that, they wouldn't really be able to tell what the print was about you know, whether it, and this could be, it could be the same situation for like an oil painting, a watercolor or anything like that. Uh, a lithograph that you've done, you know, if it's framed and if it's in glass, you have to be really careful of the reflections. So what am I, what did I, what did I, what did I do? Okay, well, I took my dining room chair and I used this as a base. I'm going to use it to prop up the photo and it's against my dining room wall. So there's really not an awful lot around to distract it. But let me show you here more about what I did. All right. This is my first trial. Okay. Here's my poster board. This is a print and depending on what submission requirements are, you might want to take a photo of it with the frame. And in this case, um, I have, it's double with the, the black border and the white around it. And I took a picture of it. And once again, I didn't really need the background, but I put it there so that I could get some sort of idea of what was going on. And guess what? It's not good. All right, what happened is I didn't have the camera flat or parallel to the photo. So if you see, you can see the black edges around it. What you might want to do is just have a picture of just the mat, or in some instances, just the print by itself. So what you have to do is you have to be more careful. So here is, um, here is another way to deal with this. What I did is I took that same dining room chair. I took a soft blanket, obviously with a bone on it. It's my dog's blanket, which is nice and soft. Uh, and I used that to make sure it was perpendicular. But if you take a look at this one, the cardboard from the poster board kind of goes down and makes it so it's not particularly square. So what I did is I brought in a cutting board, one that wasn't greasy. And then, but because the back of the seat is lower than the front, I used my favorite prop up tool, which is uh, painter's tape. I used my roll of painter's tape flat to level it out. So what we now have is we now have a perpendicular a photo that's perpendicular. So I don't have an issue with it being a trapezoid or you know have the keystoning effect. So here, uh, this is what it would look like if I just took a photo straight on with them with the two mats. It's double matted. Well, we can also take a look at another way of looking at it, which is with no mats. This is another option, but there is something wrong with this. If you take a look over here, 
there's just a little bit of ridge of the black matting that's there. If you didn't want to bother to take another photo, you can actually um, you can actually edit it if you know how to do that or take another photo. That's what's wrong. But here's what it would look like with no matting at all, more or less. All right, so <clears throat> let me show you another way. Any questions, by the way? I've been running my mouth for quite a while. Do you have any questions? Okay, let's continue. Different approach. What I did is I took uh, a red blanket, which happens to be one of the lap robes. It's lap robes that's nice and soft and fuzzy. And guess what? They don't wrinkle. Um, so I set up another photo. And once again, my husband is enjoys car shows. So I took a photo of a bunch of old sobs and I set it up here. Well, here again, we're just using the mat. So the background isn't that particularly important, but what it does do is it provides stabilization for keeping it, um, for keeping it upright, parallel. And if you were doing pictures of a whole bunch of different things, it's really easy to take one off, put another one on, click the photo, kind of do a quick review, move the next one on and so forth. And um, I know sometimes um, I have submitted photos in um, multiple photos into a show and it's possible that you would have multiple things that you wanna put in. So this is a little bit of a way. Here again, what I did is I took the blanket and I closed the door on the top and then I kind of stretched it out using painter's tape. Painter's tape is not gonna destroy the paint on the door. Uh, this happens to be a double door, but you can do it very easily with just a single solid door. Um, because guess what? Most of, a lot of the stuff that you're going to do, or I won't say a lot, but some of the stuff that you're gonna do is not gonna be any wider than 24, 30 or 36 inches wide. So a regular door anywhere in the house would work. So um, with this, um, here's just a, a photo of the photo. Uh, here again, it could be a, a photo of a litho, a, a, an oil painting or anything like that. I used photos because that's what I work with most. What we have here is we're gonna take a look at um, another thing, and this is what I'm calling the three dimensionals. In this case, it's a sculpture, it's a wood sculpture that uh, my husband's uh, grandfather did um, of the sculpture. On top of that is um, a text, textile uh, design that my mother in law did. So, in the first one, in trial one, other than everything being crowded and stuff, you have no idea. What, who wants to take a picture of what? You know, we've got the lamp, we've got the uh, recliner, uh, we've got the dog bed down at the bottom. You know, what are you doing? All right, so the second one is, well, I've taken it a little bit closer, so it's more obvious that I wanna take a, a, a photo of the sculpture, but it's not really good. And I still have a lot of distractions with the um, textile uh, hanging and all sorts of other stuff still in there. So, and plus the lighting was not wonderful. Here's what I was telling you about um, my second trial. Here's what I was talking about how I say you can use regular lights. What I did is I took a table lamp, I took the shade off on one side because it doesn't have as many bulbs. The one on the other side, I left the lampshade on because it's, it's got multiple bulbs in it. Plus I have a little bit of light coming in from the windows. These are the Eastern windows I was talking about. And this is, the, this is a revised setup. You notice that the little uh, lazy Susan is gone and that the guy is just you know, sitting on top of the trunk uh, and it's on a, a burlap runner. 
All right, so um, I'm on the burlap runner. The lighting is probably okay. Um, however, I wasn't terribly fond of this one because um, it didn't really show up the texture of the sculpture because this is really, really has a lot of texture in it and it used um, a burl uh, from, a tr from a tree uh, to go in and, and do the design. And I wanted to show some of that up and with a plain wall and the burlap runner, it just kind of melts into it a little bit. On top of that, if you look over here, if I wanted to be really picky, this is kind of wrinkled and it's and same thing over here. So it's not entirely flat. You can tell that it's on the top of a trunk, you know, with the wooden slats and stuff on it. Uh, so with that in mind, another quick fix or another quick examination of that is I took my two pieces of poster board once again and just lifted it up, slid the poster board underneath and in back. And here again, the poster board is held in back. It's leaning against the wall and it's leaning against the back of the sculpture. I took another photo. Well, I like the contrast. Uh, I like the contrast in this one. Um, but from my particular perspective, I'd like a little bit more distance on the top and on the bottom. But, you know, so would I take another photo? Would I go in and edit it or whatever? Um, I actually kind of like the lighting on it, although you could even it up a little bit. Um, so that is, you know, another way to take a look at it. Did you have any questions? Any questions? Or am I just talking too much? Questions? Concerns? How many of you folks are doing um, something with prints or, um, you know, uh, oils or something like that? Or how many are doing something three-dimensional sculptures, ceramics, or something like that? Yeah. Okay, nobody's talking to me. All right, well, anyhow, I would assume that at some point you're gonna to wanna to take pictures of either one of them. So um, with that in mind, I want to show you one more thing. Here is what I call my pandemic still life. And I have lots of things wrong with this. All right, number one, we're in the middle of a pand pandemic. That's a problem. All right, but that's not what I'm focusing on here. Uh, what I've got is obviously I've got an empty beer bottle, which is fine. You know, I took the beer bottle and I had it so you can't necessarily see the black and tan on it. Uh, and it's tipped over. Um, I have coffee with a little mouse hanging out. You know, that's a, a gift for my granddaughter. You know, she gave me several mice that supposedly for Halloween, but somehow they managed to hang out and around in different spots with coffee and a coffee mug. This coffee mug has a chip in it. All right, pandemic, you know, that's accepted. And I have dead flowers. Well, if you take a look at my dead flowers and if you look at it real closely, you can actually see me in the photo. I have a nice reflection of myself. Plus, you see windows in my front room. You know, that's reflecting in there, which you don't want. It's not only reflecting in the vase, it's reflecting in the, in the mug. It's reflecting in the coffee pot. It's reflecting in the beer bottle. It's not reflecting terribly much in the glass. Um, I also have some sort of smudge over here, which I would have to take a look at and use an eraser on or something. Um, I also, if you take a look, this is my one of my more favorite things to use, and it's actually the Science Fair project board. I have a little bit of keystoning in it. In other words, if you take a look here and here, they go in. You can play with that so that the, the position of the photo 
makes it so that it's not keystone, or you can play around with the light so that you can't see the difference between the sides and the back, because this is actually a, you know, a flat back with two little arms out of it. You also, because of the lighting, you can see the poster board. You can tell that the poster board is uh, the project board, excuse me, made out of cardboard. You know, you see your little grooves there. And for some reason, it's got this little line down here. I know for a fact that you can play around with the lighting and that will disappear. So <clears throat> um, do I have a good photo of that? No, uh, that comes tomorrow. You know, I'm going to take a take another look at it. Um, I'm probably going to change the position a little bit so that the coffee cups a little bit different, but that's a composition kind of thing. Um, so here again, this is a still life that would you could, you know, um, make a painting out of it. It's a photo that I'm going to take, but it shows some of the things that can go wrong with basically anything that you're taking a picture of. So with that. Good luck, you know, um, questions. And if you don't want to talk, you know, if you have any questions later, you can send me an email. I'll be more than happy to do that. Um, I'm also um, going to be making a, a PDF file of this and sending it over to Dale and they'll upload it so that it can be seen if you want to. But um, I know that um, folks are looking for quality photos so that they can really take a good, um, fair view at what you're trying to submit uh, so that they can do a, a fair judging of that for entry. And that's the main reason we're going through this whole exercise. Anything <clears throat> else? A Amy, you might want to mention to everyone that they can unmute themselves. Yes, you can unmute yourselves. Do you know how to do that? Yes, no, maybe. Yep. Yes. <laughs> well, I picked up uh, a lot of good tips from you tonight. Um, I can use things I actually have here in my apartment that I never tried using to take better photographs. So it's good for me. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Any questions? Do you have any recommendations for macro photography? Um, I make beaded jewelry, so most of my things are quite small. And yeah. Um, the macro photography, um, you have to be really careful with your focus and, um, and your depth of field. Um, some of it, if you take, well, this is, this is quasi macro in that the actual item is hand sized. But what I did, I had a photo of it larger and I deliberately had the stuff in back, not in focus. So, you know, you take a look at the design that's here. You know, this, I did not make this item. It was actually a gift from my daughter. But um, here you can see the nice veining and leaves and stuff. With your macro, light's important. Um, if you have, you have to be careful of what they call the depth of field. Um, some of your newer phones, uh, particularly the 12s have a much better, this is an 11 and you can tell because it's got the, the three cameras in there and it does a fair job. Uh, I myself actually also have a macro lens um, where you can, you know, fiddle with it, but you have to be very careful with your distance. And a lot of times because of the lighting, you have, it has to be very, very stable because when you're doing macro, just the tiniest jingle or movement of the camera will take it and make it blurry because you're focused in on it so close. So if you have a way of stabilizing your camera so that you either very gently touch the button or uh, for my camera, I actually have a remote where um, 
where you know it has a little um, a little uh, Wi-Fi kind of thing, and you just push the button. And I'm sure you've seen other people use it. Yeah, I have. Um, a yeah, and um, you actually, I have not done this, uh, but with a cell phone, um, you can set it up depending on your cameras or what you're using. You can set it up to uh, remotely um, activate your cell phone. I haven't done it. I've seen it done. I don't know how to do it, but that's another thing that can be done. Uh, is that helpful at all? Or did you already know all of that? With, uh, with macro photography, particularly if you're, you're doing like jewelry and stuff, you have to be really careful of what the background is. Um, you'd be, and I'm sure you know, um, how much just a speck of dust will take away a little bit of lint. Because uh, um, with the jewelry and stuff, I know that people do it on velvet. And I don't know if you do, but velvet or felt or something like that. And that is much more prone to collecting, <laughs> to collecting stuff. Um, you know, run it through the dryer, run it through the dryer to see, you know, your velvet to see, get rid of the wrinkles. That helps get rid of the dust, not entirely, or the, the, the lint that's on top. But you you'll have you might have to go through there and, and pick it all. Um, other questions? Hi, this is Doug Schulte. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you, Doug. Okay. I um I actually don't have a question, and this is not about macro, but um, just kind of a, a comment. I um I'm new to <laughs> Delray Artisans just in the last year or so, but I, I took on a a volunteer role helping post photos to Flickr. So. I'm now, you know, pulling down all the photos that people are are using for the for their call for entry. So, you know, and looking at a lot of different artist photos, and um, you know, the I, I think you know the, the presentation covered you know almost all the problems. I love the sort of you know before and after and how to change your setup to get to um, a better result. The only you know we we didn't talk much about editing or that or you know workflow, but the the one thing I would really say is that um, you know because I see some photos sometimes and they're they're blurry and I, the only thing I can think is you know maybe someone you know because cell phones do take great photos. I mean I I take you know all my photos of my art with my cell phone and and can get good results, but I always take it from the phone onto a computer and spend a little time looking at it. Um, making sure it's clear. So the, the only thing I want to say is I, I, I really can't emphasize enough that if you, you know, if you're able to, um, that it, it really, um, it's worth the, the step to, you know, to move the, the photo from your camera to your, um, your camera or your phone to your computer, you know, bring it up at a decent size on your screen, make sure it's not blurry, you know, all the kinds of problems that Amy discussed. And, you can do some very basic editing without being a Photoshop expert or anything like that. I mean, I, I have a Mac and, you know, Mac photos has some pretty simple, basic editing things where you can just take little slider scales and adjust brightness and some things like that. And it helps tremendously. So I just wanted to really emphasize that, that there's so much you can do by just, you know, taking whatever you've done on your cell phone or your, your camera pulling it onto your computer and spending just, you know, honestly, like 30 seconds adjusting a few sliders um, can really make a big difference. And in, re um, and, oops, let me unmute myself, ask to unmute. Um, what, um, what I can tell you is um, Microsoft also has that same capability and, and it comes as a default with the Microsoft. So basically when you go in and you pull up your photo, all you have to do is click on it and it comes up with, you know, edit. And you can go in and edit very, you can, you know, do some spot removals. You can crop it a little bit. You can play with some sliders and stuff and it really can make a, a big difference. What I will tell you is the photos that I took um, here for the demo, these are were all taken with my uh, iPhone. 
were taken with my iPhone. Uh, it's an iPhone 11, which is, you know, not the latest and greatest. And but I've also taken photos with, you know, with previous versions of it and moved them over, tweaked them. And particularly if you're going to submit them, you're going to need to change the file name. With my iPhone, it takes it in a different file format. And um, it's an HEIC, whatever that means. Um, but what you can do is pull them in. And then all you have to do is just click on it and hit edit and then resave it. And it saves it as a JPEG, which is one of the typical uh, photo submission formats. So it's not awfully difficult and basically um, showing somebody how to do it if you're if you're not cognizant of it once or twice and it's an it's an easy thing to do uh, like I uh, another thing I said is um, I will tell you that my um, 10 year old granddaughter oh my gracious uh, what she can do with her I with an iPhone is incredible or or, you know, just a, a plate, um, you know, not an iPhone, but, a, you know, a Sam, Samsung or any kind of other format. It's so intuitive for them at this particular point because they've grown up of it. Us older folks, sometimes it takes us a little bit longer to learn the stuff. Um, I'm, we're still working with my uh, mother-in-law who is 95, who is taking photos with her cell phone and sending them to us sometimes with a little bit of coaxing or a little bit of, um, all right, Mito, what you need to do is you need to push the blue arrow and uh, send it. So sometimes she needs a little reminding, but you know, she can do it. So, and it is good if you want to take a look. Oh, I wanted to mention one other thing that I do. Uh, Cause I work with photos and uh, sometimes my focus is not as good. What I do is I have a high definition TV. I actually take and hook up with my HDMI cable to my computer. And there's a way where you can duplicate what is on your computer to a TV. And I take that and I blow it up to, you know, a 65 inch TV, a high definition, high definition TV to see what's really wrong with it. Um, and sometimes I'm not real happy, but it helps in producing a, a better product overall. You know, I don't expect you folks to have to do it, but it really helps in the end if you, if you can manage to do that. It's also, um, sometimes I bore my kids to death on, with different shows or, or what used to be kind of like snapshots and stuff of events and put it together and give them a little slideshow on the TV. So, um, um, but here again, it is just another way to look at and do some critiquing. Now, um, what I did um, for this particular presentation and what I do for my photos, um, I talked to my brother and my husband um, who, and actually, um, I have two daughters that are into photography and for them to take a look at what I did and to uh, provide some critique, some con constructive criticism. What I have found is that in some of the groups, when you post photos of what you're doing, they'll just kind of like stuff, but they won't necessarily tell you what's wrong with it. Um, that's a little bit different in like a camera club where they actually have a graded show where they have comments from the uh, judge. But a lot of times all you do is you get a grade and you don't get any of the comments, which doesn't really help you in the long run. As long as you can take the criticism as constructive versus destructive, you're better off in the long run. <laughs> and uh, some people are more sensitive to that and some people are not. Um, I think I learned to be a little bit less sensitive about some stuff when I started working and um, 
I was doing contract work with the government and before I presented a document to, to them, you know, they go in and redline it. And I thought it, I had a perfect document. Well, they came in and they redlined the daylights out of it. You know, and after, after the bleeding was done, you learn that, yes, some of the criticisms are good, some of them aren't. And so you take them and take the ones that you agree with and actually um, do a better job next time. So it's, um, it's fun. Art is fun. And that's, you know, um, that's all I can say is I'm retired. I have more time for it, not nearly enough time, but I do have time because um, I have a lot of other things doing grandma duty, uh, helping my husband with his uh, stuff for his business and, you know, running for parts and all manner of other things. So, but um, try to take it, take time out for, for it. And I think you'll enjoy it. Anything else folks? Like I said, if you have any questions, send me an email. I, I don't mind them at all. If I don't answer right away, send it to me again. Cause I probably, even though I'm not in the business environment anymore, I probably get a whole bunch of uh, junk emails a day, over a hundred. So I go through them and delete them. <laughs> so I may uh, accidentally delete one from you because I don't necessarily open all of them or it might go in my spam folder and I might not notice it. So if you have a question and if I don't answer, send it to me again. I'm not, be, I'm not beyond being poked or prodded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Right. Enjoy and good luck with your art. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. And for those still on, yeah. we'll send out a link to the PDF when it's available. Okay. okay. Um, depending on the size of the PDF, I may uh, may send a, just a, an email to you folks with it attached. Um, I'll take a look at how big it is um, and see where we go from there. Um, so that's it. Everybody have, uh, if you have a any, great evening. Thank have you. a great evening. And those of you who haven't had dinner yet, have a good dinner. <laughs> and uh, enjoy the snow. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank and you. And be thankful for Zoom. Mm-hmm.